In ancient Rome, arena combat was an ingrained tradition that bridged the worlds of sports, politics, religion, and entertainment. It was also totally nuts. Romans loved the games, and gladiators were like rock stars and sports heroes rolled into one. They fought before massive crowds with a wide variety of weapons and often under circumstances that were mind-blowingly dangerous. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Today, we're going to take a look at some insane facts about what it was like to be a Roman gladiator. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know in the comments below what other historical entertainment you would like to hear about. Okay, this is going to escalate quickly. When we think of gladiators, we tend to picture warriors fighting for sport in an arena as entertainment for a crowd. However, that wasn't always the case. Long before the games became a public event, gladiator combat was part of the funeral rites for Rome's wealthiest aristocrats. It was believed that the spilling of blood in combat would purify the soul of the deceased and prepare them for their coming time in the afterlife. This ritual, which had been appropriated from Etruscan culture, was originally a luxury reserved only for the richest Roman citizens. But as time went on and the culture evolved, the fights transformed into highly popular state-funded spectacles. The idea of two people fighting to the afterlife for sport might sound pretty insane to us, but for the ancient Romans, it got old real fast. So to keep things exciting and hopefully keep the crowds coming back, promoters turned to gimmicks. Instead of 10 cent beer night, there was onda betai, a gimmick that meant in combat, the gladiators wore blindfolds and helmets without eye holes. And if that's not dangerous enough, they also couldn't wear any armor, being restricted to only loincloths and sandals. Yeah, it sounds pretty harsh, especially if it's a chilly day. But this particularly brutal contest was typically reserved for criminals who had been sentenced to death. Spectacles in the arena weren't limited to human combat. Wild animals like crocodiles, elephants, and lions were also part of the action. The animals might be pitted against each other or sometimes fight against a human. When these events occurred, the beasts didn't typically fight with regular gladiators. Rather, they were usually part of a special hunting event which featured warriors known as Venatores and Bestiari. Venatores were highly trained hunters armed with spears and bows who would showcase their formidable skills by killing animals from a distance. Bestiari, on the other hand, were criminals accused of particularly heinous offenses. They typically had no combat training and were tossed into the arena as punishment for their crimes. The bestiari were usually taken out by the animals they faced, which absolutely delighted the crowds. Matches like these were often the opening event of the games, because presumably, nothing says fun entertainment like a convict being eaten by a croc. Chomp, chomp, chomp. The vast majority of gladiators were men, but there were some women. Although it's not known when the practice started, women are also known to have fought in the arena. The existence of these warriors, known as gladiatresses, is known only from a handful of accounts. However, some historians believe they may have been a common feature of the games by the first century. Gladiatresses fought for spectacle and often joined in the hunting activities. But the gladiatresses weren't always treated as respectfully as their male counterparts. They were often used in parody matches meant to get laughs from the crowd. For example, the Emperor Domitian is known to have staged fights between gladiatresses and dwarves. Despite this, there were also legitimate contests between these lady gladiators, and they were known to have fought with honor. An ancient commemorative relief in the city of Halicarnassus depicts such a battle. Fought between two women identified as Aquila and Amazon, the relief suggests the combatants were released after the battle ended in a stalemate. The age of the gladiatresses came to an end in the year 200, when Emperor Septimus Severus banned them from the games. Hollywood would have us believe that gladiatorial combat was a gory hellscape that didn't end until someone was dead, but the truth is much more complicated. In actuality, gladiators were expensive to train, and they also had to be fed and housed. As such, their owners weren't exactly in a rush to see their investment get taken out in the arena. As a result of these financial considerations, killing was a lot less common than we've all been led to believe. To help minimize expenses, there were numerous loopholes that allowed for both combatants to escape the fight alive. 
For example, if the fight grew boring, it might be declared a stalemate, so the event could move on to the next match. Conversely, if a fight was particularly thrilling, both gladiators might be rewarded for putting on such a good show and then allowed to leave with honors. If all else failed, a gladiator who had been squarely beaten, or was about to be, could always beg for their life. The defeated gladiator would have to acknowledge their loss by raising their fingers. Once this was done, there was a chance his life could be spared. But there were no guarantees. The final decision about who lived and who died rested with an arbiter. Different games had different arbiters, unless the emperor was present, in which case the emperor was always the arbiter. Arbiters could do whatever they pleased, but they often took the wishes of the crowd into account. By cheering for a fighter they liked, a crowd could literally save the man's life. Pro athletes get a ton of respect today, but in ancient Rome, it was a little different. Crowds loved the gladiators, but they didn't want to associate with them personally, because socially speaking, entertainers were considered to be low on the social totem pole. This reality made it awkward for everyone on the rare occasion an emperor decided he wanted to get into the arena and fight. And it did happen. Despite being seen as a massive degradation of themselves and their empires, emperors like Titus and Caligula couldn't resist the call of the arena. Thanks to Ridley Scott's 2000 film Gladiator, the most famous of the fighting emperors is Commodus. Commodus was presented as an egomaniac who insists on personally fighting Russell Crowe's Maximus before the crowds at the arena. This might feel like something contrived for the screen, but the real Commodus believed himself to be a divine warrior of the people, and he did enjoy fighting in the games. Of course, he didn't like the idea of losing in the games, so just like in the film, he preferred to fight in a staged or rigged combat, where the odds were overwhelmingly in his favor. Whether gladiators or golfers, everybody lets the boss win. Gladiators are usually depicted fighting with swords, but in real life they used a wide array of weapons. This variety of combat was another way for promoters to keep things interesting, and in any given match, a crowd might see gladiators fighting with swords, spears, lances, and shields. These weapons each offered advantages and disadvantages that shaped the gladiator's fighting style. This, in turn, would create a personal brand that might make one particular warrior more memorable than the others. Along these lines, weapons were often assigned based on the gladiator's home culture. For example, Thracians got curved short swords, and Samnites used lances. One highly specialized class of gladiator were the Retiari. Their style was based on the practices of fishermen, which meant that they typically wore little armor. This in turn made them highly mobile and agile, allowing them to use their weapons to maximum effect. Those weapons, again, were the weapons of a fisherman, namely a trident and a net. The idea would be for the retiari to use their mobility to avoid their more heavily armored opponent. At an opportune moment, they would then try to snare their enemy in the net and then quickly run them through with the trident. In the same way that modern boxers need to be separated into weight classes to keep things competitive, ancient gladiators were broken up into classes based on differences in their weapons and armor. The major divisions were between lightly armored combatants and heavily armored combatants, but there were numerous subcategories of each. The fighters were also separated according to experience level, so that new recruits didn't find themselves up against veterans. The lightly armored gladiators typically fought in the middle of the day, after the opening beast fights, while the toughest and most experienced fighters were saved for last. So let's say you were too scared to fight, or maybe taking out another human being for the entertainment of a crowd violated your moral principles. Could you get out of it? Uh, no. You could beg for mercy if you lost, but gladiators scheduled for a contest were absolutely required to fight. Anyone who refused to fight would be attacked by the slave manager and his team, usually with whips and hot metal rods. Why do the rods have to be hot? The only sure way to avoid combat was to commit suicide, which wasn't always an easy task, as if it's ever an easy task. It's a bit of a rock in a hard place situation. Take, for example, a group of Germanic prisoners from the year 401 who were looking to avoid fighting in the arena. The only way they got out? They had to strangle themselves. That takes commitment. The Roman Empire had contact with numerous other cultures and gladiators could come from any of them. As such, many gladiators had armor that was reflective of their origin. 
For example, Germanic gladiators often wore heavy armor, while Greeks and others from the east of the empire typically wore light armor. Mermilo gladiators wore fish-shaped crests on their helmets and were accordingly known as fishermen gladiators. Romans loved all types of combat, including vehicular combat, which is not to be confused with chariot racing, an entirely different event. There was even a class of gladiators who specialized in such fights. Known as the Esedari, these fighters used chariots as a platform for gladiatorial combat. They typically performed reenactments of famous battles in which Rome fought using chariots, such as in the fight against the British warrior queen, Boudica. While large-scale battles in the gladiatorial games weren't unknown, they weren't typical either. Rather than epic spectacles, the vast majority of fights were simple skirmishes between two combatants in an otherwise empty arena. Once again, this had to do with the considerable expense involved in training and maintaining gladiators. Fielding so many fighters at once would require deep pockets. Accordingly, such large-scale fights were usually reserved for special occasions for the richest and most powerful spectators. So what do you think? How long would you last in the arena? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.